May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. It was strange that Judas chose to come to dinner that night. After all, everyone knew he'd been hanging out with the enemy and that he was up to something. Then he allowed Jesus to wash his feet. After that, no one really expected him to stay for the Passover Seder, but he did. It turned out to be the Last Supper that all of them would share together. Through the years, Judas had been disconsolate at best. He was like your crazy uncle at Thanksgiving. He had conspiracy theories and ideas about revolution, fears of who was coming after them and how they must join the zealot movement and much, much more. Ideas which his band of brothers could not abide. Although he had served as treasurer for the Jesus movement, they didn't have much money to speak of, so it's not like he managed the funds, but he had always made a big deal about where they spent the money and how they spent the money, commenting to all the time what was right and what was wrong about every expenditure. And that was Judas at his best. At his worst, Judas was a betrayer. He was a deceiver. He was a deceptive man. He was a turncoat. In the end, he would turn Jesus over to the Roman guard and the leaders of the temple and give him for execution. He did this for blood money, for 30 pieces of silver. And he seemed certain when he started the venture. Then in the end, he was overwhelmed with grief and shame. Scripture tells us that Judas was afflicted by emotional and spiritual conflicts. I believe he suffered from some form of mental illness. He was haunted by his visions of what Jesus should say and should do and where the money should go, and on and on. And on the night of betrayal, he tried to force Jesus' hand, but Jesus held his cards tight. He never followed Judas's plan, and that brought about the unraveling of Judas. Within 24 hours of the Seder dinner ending, Jesus and Judas would be dead. Jesus would be executed by crucifixion, and Judas would be dead by suicide. Each one would die on a tree, one tied and nailed to a tree in the form of a cross, and the other on a limb in a noose at the end of a rope. But on this night, like no other night, as the words of the Passover Seder say, on this night, the shadow of death would not pass over them. On this night, the shadow of death hung over the table where Jesus and Judas and 11 of their closest friends gathered, remembering the Exodus story, breaking the unleavened bread, drinking wine and soaking in the last full measure of time and space with one another. They were laughing and singing, eating and drinking, praying and remembering. Before the night was through, Judas would betray Jesus with a kiss. I've often wondered about that kiss. It must have broken Jesus' heart. When he looked Judas in the eye, he said, you have betrayed me with a kiss. He must have had tears in his eyes. He must have had a quiver in his voice. He must have had a question in the tone of his delivery because Jesus loved Judas. Jesus died twice on Good Friday. First, 
from a broken heart, of betrayal and desertion, and then from crucifixion. But just as Jesus forgives Judas in his own way, we must forgive those who forsake us and turn against us. Moreover, when they die by suicide, we need to remember them. We need to still speak their names. Their suffering unto death by their own hands doesn't need the additional pain inflicted by our struggles to understand them. We may not understand Judas in this story tonight, but we understand that Jesus loved him. Jesus loves all in spite of the pain and trauma of betrayal and denial and rejection, and we must love everyone in spite of it too. In the end, Jesus asked for his disciples to remember one thing. He asked them to remember that the bread was his body and that the wine was his blood. He asked them to remember him when they were gathered somewhere down the road to break bread and drink wine. He wasn't asking very much at all. In reality, he was asking for everything. Tonight, I want you to remember. Remember the bread and the wine are the body and the blood of Christ. Remember that last suppers often become resurrection feasts. Remember those beautiful moments that you have treasured at dinner tables and picnic tables with loved ones that sometimes precede what becomes a dreadful dawn of a day that comes next. And remember what happened. Remember what they said there. And remember what it means to you. In the aftermath of this night, two of the 13 soon would be dead. All of the remaining company of believers, all of their friends and family, and all those who followed Jesus to the cross would be changed forever. Everything changed on this night. Our faith was formed in a new way as a sacrament of life came into being on this night through the institution of the Lord's Supper. On this night, Jesus gave us this gift, this gift of remembrance. He offers us the sacrament of life as we are initiated into the sacrament of Holy Communion. And we must remember this sacrament is never, never private property of some sacred hierarchy. The sacrament is foundational for all of human life. The love and the grace that we experience in this Eucharist ce celebration is basic to human life. Daily life is full of sacraments. In the archeology span of everyday life, the sacraments thrive they are known in simple things, in a cup of water, in a drink of coffee, in a beautiful moment shared with friends and family. They're sacraments. They're signs that contain and exhibit and recall and visualize and communicate a whole nother reality. A reality different from ourselves, different from themselves as they present themselves to us. So let us remember the sacrament of life that is given tonight. The sacrament never tears away from this world, not at all. The sacrament always calls us to look more closely and more deeply into the heart of this world. Tonight, as we come to Christ's table of grace, I want us to breathe deeply the meaning of this night. Tonight, Jesus takes and blesses and breaks and shares himself as a sacrament for the life of the world.
Tonight he offers the sacraments to Judas and Peter, to John and Thomas, because the bread of life and the cup of blessing are for betrayers and deniers. They're for beloved disciples and for doubting disciples. Tonight, despite everything we have said and we have done, he wants to wash our feet. He wants to be for us a presence of love. He wants us to come join him at the table. He wants us to receive the bread and the wine. He wants us to receive his body and his blood. He just wants us to join him. Amen.